For years and years and years, we've been raising meat animals on our homestead. We pretty much started right out the gate with meat chickens. And after about a year or two of doing some meat chickens, I had the meat bug. I figured, you know what, we're going to raise some pigs next. And we did pigs for a couple years and we expanded from there. And over the years here at our channel, here at Homesteady, we have done pigs, we've done chickens, we've done turkeys, we've had goats, we've had lambs and sheep. We've raised almost every kind of meat animal you could imagine. But there was one glaring spot on our channel, on our podcast, that we had never covered, never talked about, and I got comments about it every single day. Aust, rabbits. Rabbits, rabbits. For years and years and years, people have been saying, when are you going to do rabbits? And every single year, my answer was the same thing. Probably next year. I kept putting it off, putting it off, because it was totally new. Totally new kind of animal, totally new kind of infrastructure. And at the end of the day, in my mind, it was the same kind of product as what I was getting from my chickens. So I didn't have a real big push to do it. Well, as you guys know from watching the channel this last year, I've had about the biggest push I've ever had to do the most things on the homestead ever. My fifth baby just kicked us in the rear and pushed us to do all kinds of new things. He has a lot of food allergies. Everything that Kay eats winds up affecting him. And so immediately we went to the lists of foods that were low on the allergy uh, you know, possibility that you would be allergic to it. And rabbit was one of the leading sources of meat on the low allergy list. So just like that, after about six or seven years of dragging my feet, we went out and got a breeding pair of rabbits. But before we did, we had to do some research because we don't like to dive into anything without doing a little bit of research at least. We found a book, Raising Meat Rabbits in a Colony. We found this book and we tore into the book and we learned everything there was to know about how to get started with rabbits in a different kind of environment than at least what we're used to seeing here in the United States. First videos came out on the channel and it was like the rabbit police came out of everywhere. Wee, wee, what are you doing? Everybody's going to die. It's going to be a murder scene. This is not going to work. Raising rabbits in hutches is what we're used to seeing here. But in other places, like all the way over in New Zealand, uh, raising rabbits in a colony is more normal, more what you might be used to seeing. And tonight we're going to talk to the author who wrote the book that we built our whole rabbit colony off of. Donna Thompson is here. She has a website and a YouTube channel. You can click the link below to subscribe to her YouTube channel. I'm, go I'm hoping I'm going to say this right. P. Waka Waka Valley Homestead. Did I get it right, Donna? Yeah, you did. All right, good. I got to work on my New Zealand pronunciation, but uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, Donna. We've been really looking forward to this interview. Let's talk about rabbits. Why are meat rabbits something that we should be thinking about, Dana? Donna, I'm huh? going to do that. I'm, I knew right away. It's Donna, not it's okay. Dana. She's, it is Donna. It's okay. <laughs> And she called me Dana all the time. It <laughs> not just the accent. <laughs> um, meat rabbits are great. The reason we got them, we wanted some kind of meat production, right? Um, so it was something that we could get into really easily. It's got a really low cost to get into. So we built a shed and we kept them in there. Um, and so it was a really good way for us to get quick meat for the family. They're small. You can raise them in a backyard, which was the other good thing. Um, I know of a lot of people here that will just grow them in hutches in their backyard because they're considered pets, right? So um, you can pick up a breeding pair for, say, 40 or $50 and get a couple of hutches and 
grow them in your backyard. It's the, that's the best thing about them. They grow really fast. You can have grow outs ready for the freezer in eight to 10 weeks, which is quite similar to your commercial chickens um, speed wise, um, but they're self replicating. You're not having to get them from a hatchery or whatever. That is one of the biggest reasons I have started to shift our focus here at this homestead. That one little thing right there, a lot of people are homesteading for self-sufficiency. The Cornish cross, you, you cannot call that self-sufficient because you are dependent on the hatchery for that. Rabbits, total opposite. But now you did mention something important there. Uh, when we are thinking about the self-sufficiency side of things, that means we are doing the breeding we want to make sure we have what you said, a good breeding pair. So what some advice do you give to someone if they're going to get started? There's always the get the cheapest thing out there if that's all you can afford. But if you if you have a little bit more, what do you look for when getting started in a breeding pair? So, I mean, any rabbits made of meat, right? So you can you can eat any of them but some of them are worth your time a bit more than others. There are some breeds that are better for it than others. New Zealand Whites, despite the name, were actually bred in America. <laughs> <laughs> where the name came from. Um, and they, for me, they were the best that we could find. We found a line actually all the way up in the North Island. So I paid quite a bit to get them shipped down, but it was life-changing having the better breed, the better ones. So they're a lot bigger. And if you're looking confirmation wise, you want ones that when you have them sitting, they look like a ball. They've kind of got this big arch to them. They're not all long and flat. And then your hips and your shoulders should be about the width, same width if you're looking down on top of them. So that's considered good confirmation. So you're gonna get lots of meat in the haunches as well as lots in the shoulder. You mentioned the New Zealands. Is there any others out there that you would say are also another good one if they can't find the New Zealands? Yeah, for sure. There's three that are kind of classically bred specifically for meat, and that would be the New Zealand, the Californian, and the Florida White. And the Flemish, a lot of people ask about the Flemish giant, uh, but the problem with them, I mean, you can eat them, they're made of meat, but those first <laughs> eight to ten weeks, they tend to spend their time building bone structure. Oh, wow. So you'll get a lot less, they'll be heavy, but you'll actually get a lot less meat off them. <laughs> they, they don't they're muscle up till later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my problem. <laughs> people, a lot of people have been opened up to the idea of a colony. I'm seeing emails and questions on the channel. Aust, I, I like the way this looks. People who wanted to do rabbits but didn't want to do them because of the cage thing uh, are now interested in this. But like everything, I, I said this recently in a video, we talked about this. Uh, there's pros and cons to everything. So let's dive into that. Uh, colonies cages let's talk about both of them and give us your advice on both the very first time i even came across the idea of a colony was i was a kid and we went my mum was a preschool teacher the preschool wanted a rabbit so we went to see this breeder lady who had the shed and we go inside and it's just there's rabbits and guinea pigs everywhere and they're hooning around and it looked really healthy and lovely the rabbits was just so happy and they're like jumping around and kick flipping and having grand old time and I was like, that is the way to raise a rabbit <laughs> and so when we decided to get me rabbits I, I was just like we can't keep them in that, that just didn't sit right with me rabbits are naturally really social they're quite different to the American cottontails which are quite solitary animals and hares are quite solitary as well whereas the English rabbit they are really social. They live in big social groups. They love to snuggle. They have a social hierarchy. Uh, so it just made sense to me that it was a lot more natural way to actually keep them. But there are some merits to keeping them in cages, right? So in a cage, they're easy to catch. They're easy to keep clean, especially if your cage has a grate on the floor. I've seen some really good ones with hanging cages with grated floors where they just have a bucket underneath that the poop all falls into. Um, if you've got them separate in a cage, they can't fight. They have no social hierarchy, but they can't fight either. Um, and you can stack quite a few cages into a smaller space. If you're limited on space, maybe a colony might not be the best, best option, but 
um, you can do a colony on in a fairly small space if you don't have too many bunnies. When you release them into the colony, what do you see about the fighting? Usually the dominant doe will have a go at anyone new and say I'm the boss. It's similar to chickens. There's a bit of a pecking order. The boys, if there's only one boy there and there's a bunch of girls, it'll tend to be the girls that are fighting. The boys are pretty laid back and will stick to themselves. If you stick a couple bucks in together and your current buck is territorial, then you'll have problems. Uh, they have been known to castrate each other very quickly. Rabbit claws and rabbit teeth are very sharp and they seem to have really good aim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally speaking, the bucks are pretty laid back and it's the girls that you'll get them being grumpy, especially if there's a litter in the, in the colony at the time some does get really protective and that is one of the downsides to the New Zealand whites is they're not as personable or I've never had any problem with them but I know that they can get pretty snarky so it does tend to be the girls that you have to watch out for but if there's plenty of space usually you can just plop them in and they'll have a bit of a scuffle and sort themselves out pretty quickly. That's pretty much what we saw when we added the new ones there was a scuffle and we're used to that with almost every animal. You, th you throw new chickens together, you throw new pigs together, new goats. Everybody's going to, you know, have at it for a few minutes. And there is a difference between endangering another animal and them just establishing rank. And you kind of get used to after homesteading for so many years, you can usually spot pretty quickly, this is going somewhere bad or oh, this is going to be okay. You sit and you watch it for a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so that was one of the biggest things we saw in the comment section when we started with the colony was they're going to fight, um, they're going to castrate the males, the females will castrate the males, the males will castrate the females, everybody's going to kill everybody. <laughs> Didn't happen. <laughs> but generally, yeah, generally it doesn't happen, right? Yeah. Um, and you can cull really hard for vicious animals. If you have a nasty doe that's just going everybody, she'll make a really good stew. <laughs> <laughs> while we were talking about the colony now uh, we you, you did mention i mean there are pros to a cage uh there's pros to you know you can control the breeding a little bit better you can fit more in a tighter space cleaning is an easier thing uh, what about the colony what are the pros to the colony other than the rabbits have a nice well, happy life yeah well i mean that's a big thing that's though, a big right? one yeah like, i shouldn't like other than that <laughs> Happy meets healthy meat and you know that they've had a good life and just one rough day. Um, but the other good things about it, the rabbits tend to be more friendly. If you let them run, they don't feel so threatened. And so even our rabbits that weren't picked up and cuddled will come running up for food. Whereas in a cage, those same rabbits would probably attack you when you open the cage because they're feeling threatened. They're all closed in. Whereas when they've got that freedom, they tend to make for nice. But you do tend to, in a colony, your rabbits will tend to be hardier. Um, they develop to a lot of things. Um, they get a lot better muscle tone because they're able to run around. And so you'll probably find, usually they sort of meet up a bit faster than the cage ones. I don't know. For me, the big payoff was the happy rabbits. Um, the letting them naturally breed was really, um, took a lot of stress away from trying to work out when you should be breeding rabbits and all that sort of stuff as well. That was something I loved how you covered that in your book. It was very kind of just like eye-opening. Uh, the first round of comments that we got when we did the, we announced we're doing a colony was everyone's going to kill everyone. And the second was, what about the doe being overbred? She's got, he's never going to give her a break. She's going to constantly being bred. Talk a little bit. What have you seen raising rabbits in a colony as far as the breeding cycle? How does that go? Well, Rabbit, rabbits are prey animals, right? So they, they die easy and they breed readily. And so that's just their role in nature is that they do breed a lot. And if you have a wild herd of rabbits, flock of rabbits, I don't even know what, <laughs> I think they've got a fluff full of rabbits. <laughs> How can you forget a fluff full? <laughs> so yeah, actually they come into their own natural cycle. So when you first put them together, you'll find that they probably will have babies every four weeks pretty quickly. Um, but it does eventually settle down as long as the doe has really good condition. So she's getting a plenty of high protein food and she's not all skin and bone. Then she is usually happier breeding. That's, that's what they're 
made to do that's their role in life and so but when she's sick of it she will tell that buck to rack off (laughs) (laughs) they're quite happy to stand their ground and just say no it depends where you live but in places that get quite hot over the heat of the summer they'll often stop slow down you'll often miss a batch or two over the heat of the summer and then sometimes in the cold of the winter if you get really really cold they'll often skip there as well and sort of focus more on spring and autumn or spring and fall <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned this quickly but it i remember this really resonating with us we have so much going on in this homestead so many animals that we have to manage a lot like high management letting them breed at a more natural cycle what does that do for your life well, it's, it just takes the whole stress off the whole breeding program thing. We made sure we had a really good buck and we had some good does, um, but it was just so much less worrying about it. And we always had an extra doe in the wings just in case something happened. So we would often keep one. And if it got to the point where they were getting a wee bit older and closer to breeding and our actual breeders were still fine, we'd often sell it on as a pet or whatever. That's another good question. A lot of people ask was, how do you make sure as the grow outs are getting closer to being ready? Are they also getting close to actually where they could start trying to breed? Do you control that? Do you separate them? Do you worry about that? Do you butcher them before you even have to worry about that? How does that work out? You'll find a a line that's maturing, that's growing to a good size by eight weeks will be ready to breed usually by about three or four months. So you, it's unlikely that they'll be bred at eight weeks. Yeah, that's so that's, I mean, plenty of time. You have plenty of time there. We're going to keep talking about raising meat rabbits, but first it's time to do the Home City Camel Train shout out. And today's shout out goes to Brooke and Jason. Brooke and Jason are busy starting a farm called Circle T Farm, which is located in North Carolina. They currently have ducks and donkeys. Hopefully in the future you'll find some chickens, geese, turkeys, goats, and pigs at Circle T. If you want to follow along with them and see if they wind up getting all those animals, you can do that. I'll put a link below to their Facebook group. Go ahead and say hi to them from a Homesteady follower and thank you for today's episode they sponsored. There is a lot of information in that Pioneer Library about all that livestock, guys, so enjoy that. Thank you for sponsoring this episode. And now let's get back to talking about meat rabbits, which is another animal you should think about getting on Circle T Farm. We have ours now. We actually just, you'll see this upcoming video on the channel. Uh, We actually just today moved them. We've had them in little prototype tractor, rabbit tractor. And we just moved them into, I finished up a John Siskovich chicken tractor, nice big tractor. And we put 11 of our furthest along grow outs in the tractor. And we've been doing this now for a couple weeks in the smaller prototype one that I built. And what I noticed right away is I gave them uh, on-demand pellets because I understand I want to make sure they're getting the minerals they need. I want to make sure they're getting that protein level. But they selectively chose the grass 100%. It wasn't until that was mowed and we hadn't yet moved them that they'd start working on the pellet. Are they going to get in a good, and I know this, you know, everybody's grass is different. What's growing is different, but can they get what they need in, a, you know, if they're out in a chicken or out in a rabbit tractor, or if you're moving them into different paddocks, will they get enough from that? Do you still have to supplement? Wild rabbits here eat nothing but grass and fruit tree bark. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like you've had a few problems with that. (laughs) (laughs) But generally they eat grass, they eat weeds, they eat what's out in the pasture. And that's what they live off and they thrive off it. We are, you know, we have a real overpopulation problem here because they thrive off the grass. They will grow slightly slower, but for me, if I could, I would grow them on grass because that payoff for us is worth it yeah. to not be putting all the feed money into them for us. That we, so we would, um, even our ones in the shed, we can't harvest, we can't have them on our wild grass because of the wild rabbits carrying RCD, which will just kill all our rabbits. So we have 
an area that's all fenced off that the wild rabbits can't get into that grows long grass. So we would harvest big handfuls of that. So our rabbits would always get whatever dry food they were getting plus a big handful, big handfuls of grass. Um, and so our rabbits would get dry food as well as a big handful of grass um, each day for them to eat. So either way, any kind of supplementation is going to ease that feed bill and we have seen a huge change. Now, I appreciate what Donna said. Um, it will cause them to grow slower. So you got to remember, like we've talked about in the last video we made about this, there are pros and cons to everything. If you want a big fat rabbit quick, having that perfectly for formulated feed, uh, that's going to do the trick. Your homestead and your advice to others, is it 100% for meat, just rabbit? Is it a 50 50 75 20 with some meat chickens in there what do you guys find yourselves doing and you know what do you advise for others trying to do what you're doing yeah i, I guess it depends if you don't want to be importing chickens from a, a a hatchery all the time then maybe rabbits is a better idea if you're looking at breeding your own chickens knowing that they're going to take longer to grow out you know maybe do both i personally miss the skin like a chicken and rabbit taste very similar but the chicken skin is awesome <laughs> oh man you're it's so funny you are exactly all my bullet points in my head you're psh, 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 psh. so when you're cooking let's the final thing i wanted to make sure we cover what do you get in rabbit versus chicken uh and then you know any tips for those who have never had rabbit before what do they do with it rabbit Obviously, you're taking the skins off. Otherwise, you're going to have a fluffy dinner. <laughs> uh, so you have to cook it similar to what you would like a, a skinless chicken. So it, you've got to add some moisture in there. The, it is really low in fat. So you need to add some extra fat in there as well. Wrapping it in bacon is a really good option. <laughs> um, Who needs skin when wrap, you have bacon? <laughs> wrap all the things in bacon. Yeah. Um, we would often do more like a stew or a casserole sort of idea with some tomatoes and spices and things. Generally speaking, especially if it's for an older rabbit or a bigger rabbit, stewing it's the way to go. The slow cooker is really quite helpful. You wouldn't want to be roasting it, I don't think, um, because unless you've got it wrapped in something like bacon, because it will just dry out too much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well this has been a awesome deep dive into rabbits 101 i i put out an email today donna that we were going to cover meat rabbits 101 and you two would not let me make a live stream called that so i just called it raising rabbits on a homestead but we got away with it so we got the whole everyone's still watching if you have any questions now's the time to fire them off i'm going to check at the uh live from the barn chat box see if any of our homestead pioneers have any questions before we finish up here. I did want to let those of you watching live know, before we dive into questions, uh, this will be our last live on YouTube. Uh, we were doing it live on YouTube during the quarantine time. Our quarantines are starting to lift, and so uh, the upcoming shows are gonna be back just at the website, live from the barn. We have a couple really good shows coming up on chicken health. We have a show coming up about uh, IPPs specifically, the Idaho pastured pigs, but also just talking about grazing pigs in general. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about Cooney Coonies in there. Um, we have a somebody coming on to talk about feed. We have a whole episode about goats and what they're going to do to your life. <laughs> so we have a lot of really good shows coming out. As you know, those of you who aren't pioneers, we do release uh, a, a good segment from each of these shows. So you'll be seeing still these shows. But if you want to join us live, uh, become a Homesteady Pioneer. This is homesteady.com. Click on shop and then Pioneer. There might even be a link below this video to do so. You can join live and you can ask questions. I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. This was a awesome deep dive into rabbits. If people want to continue learning about meat rabbits, first off, tell us about your book. And then also you do a lot more. Right now you're not even doing meat rabbits, but you do a lot more at the homestead. So tell us about your book and then tell us about where people can find you and what to, what to expect. I put the book together. First it started, I was writing blog posts on my, I've got a blog, Pewaka Valley. It's now .co.nz, but if you go to .com, it'll redirect, um, which I know is really hard to spell. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when we started here, Pewaka is like a little uh, 
it's a fantail bird and pewakawaka is the maori name for it and it just means that it moves quickly like this um <laughs> and so we named the place pewakawaka valley because we have so many of them here i didn't expect it to become a thing where other people in the states had to try and find us <laughs> sorry it's really hard to spell um Anyway, so I started writing stuff on the blog about keeping meat rabbits in colonies because there was just no information out there and I was learning a lot. There's quite a good Facebook group that I was an admin in for a really long time called Meat Rabbits and Colonies. And um, so the stuff I was learning as we were going, I was writing it on the blog and then someone said, why don't you write a book? And so I've kind of compiled a lot of that information plus a bunch more and a disease reference section and stuff and made it into a book which is now on amazon and it's i'm surprised it's i sell a couple of those a week like there, there's quite a bit of interest into that yeah, I'm, so, I'm not surprised it's a great book and it was easy to find and it was uh very very thorough i, I was it answered all our questions getting into this we we had heard about colonies before but we like you said we were looking for a resource and there still is not a whole lot on the internet shocking <laughs> Um, and, uh, it was a great book. I'm actually, while you're sharing this with us, I'm going to add the link to the description so people, or to the chat box so people can go look at it right now. Cool. So if people want to ask me more questions, they're welcome to, I, they can either contact me, like email me through the webs. My blog's got a contact thingy on it. Or I also have a Facebook group, like it's called Homestead Anywhere with Pewakuka Valley. And so if you want to join that group, you're welcome to and ask me rabbity questions in there. I'm quite happy to answer them as I can. And then uh, as far as here on YouTube, let's go flood right now your YouTube channel. Where can people find it? That's uh, in the description of this video. Tell us about your YouTube channel. Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel that I put videos on twice a week on growing and preserving your own food and other homesteading bits and bobs. Um, and so I post, it's our Monday and Friday, which I guess in the US is like a Sunday and a Thursday, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, just to confuse everybody. Um, and yeah, so it's, my channel's called Pewakuka Valley Homestead, which again, it's hard to spell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still will put a link somewhere, surely. <laughs> we got a link in the description. It's actually though, I... It's phonetic. You think of Fozzie Bear, right? Waka Waka, there's half of it right there. P.I. Fozzie Bear. We're good to go. If you enjoyed this interview, you would love the extended version. Donna went on to talk about how to feed rabbits grass clippings from your lawnmower without it actually hurting them, which it can do. We don't do it personally because I tend to use the grass as a mulch on the garden, but I do know that you can do it. She also went into more detail about which rabbit breeds to select, and she even talked about raising little meat mutts. Um, but a lot of people also run what they call meat mutts, and that's when they, you know, you buy whatever you can afford and then just add big genes. You can learn about this and a whole lot more in the extended version. It's twice as long as the episode you just saw, and if you become a homesteading pioneer, you can watch this and all our extended versions. You can even join us live for these interviews and ask questions, just like a few of the pioneers did during this episode. So click here to become a home study pioneer, gain access to our library of extended versions, join us live for these interviews, and check out this video from Piwaka Waka Valley's YouTube channel. It has Cooney Cooney pigs, they're adorable, you're going to enjoy it. <laughs>